Hi, Janice. Hi, good morning. How are you today? Oh, wonderful. Are you ready to talk about how congestion pricing, plastic bags, and smoking bans will affect home buyers? I am. This is going to be interesting. Yeah, so this is this is sort of a, a close to home for me. Uh, New York is on the verge of passing some new laws that deal with these three things. So I was just curious. Let's. I wanted to have this sort of conversation and this thought process of how New York's proposed uh, congestion congestion pricing, plastic bags ban, and smoking laws would affect home buyers and maybe home prices. Yeah, absolutely. Let's start off with the. I think the most. Um, Relatable one, the plastic bag ban. All right. Yes. So there's, this takes a lot of different forms. This is, this relates to those, uh, you know, those thin plastic bags you get at the supermarket. Uh, so Janice, how is it in your neighborhood? Are they, are they pushing for paper bags now versus plastic or is it still, you know, do they, do they still give you both options? They give you both options, but yeah. if you look now everywhere, they're trying to promote the use of the reusable bags, right. you know, with a couple pennies off of your yep. entire, yeah. So they're trying to promote it and make it a, a better choice, uh, but so, still all of them are available. Right. So in New York, it's going to be, I think, a hard ban. Uh, I think in California, it's currently you, you pay more if you use the plastic or actually, actually I don't right. know the exact mechanics, but I do believe it, a hard ban is coming to New York. Um, so what does that mean? Okay. So let's just assume, I don't even think this is a fair assumption, but let's assume it's generally better for the environment. And I actually have conflicting thoughts on that. Yeah. I have to agree with you. I'm definitely conflicted on this subject. I'm not sure it's a good use of our, our collective societal energy to focus on this when, and we'll go through that right now. Okay. Number one, a, a bag on plastic bags doesn't really make a whole lot of sense for, for folks in, in cities like where, where I live. And let me just run down the list of why that is. Okay. Janice. You, you have pets, yeah? I do. I have a dog. And do you clean up after your dog or does he just go in, in areas in your backyard or I don't know how that works. I'm not a pet owner. Yeah. No, you are actually required by law to clean up after your pet. Okay. So do you, what do you use? I mean, do you use... Uh, that's mm -hmm. an interesting question is yeah. I, when we go to the grocery store, I do use plastic bags yeah. for the sole purpose of coming home to put them and I have a, a, a crate and we use... We, reuse them to yep. pick up after the pets. Yep. So in the, you know, yeah, that that's very common here in Manhattan as well. I mean, there's a lot of street activity, <laughs> excrement <Yes>. activity. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, so if you ban these shopping plastic bags, what's the impact going to be? Pet owners just have to buy plastic bags now, right? <laughs> right. We are going to have to. Now, we. I already do buy little ones, you know, for the dog when you're walking and you can put them sure. in your pocket. Right. But we're going to have to increase our purchasing of that because we must use plastic. I, I personally don't know another way around cleaning up after them without sure. using the plastic bag. So it's going to cost us a little more money. We're going to have to um, purchase something different. And not just that, in terms of the environment, whereas you had a bag that was being used twice, once for right. shopping and once for dog poop, now it's just being used once. So does right. that feels a little less efficient, at least. And, you know, economically, interestingly enough, I'm going to order them off of Amazon because that's yeah. how I do things. So yeah. now you've got to ship it. You've got to put oh, them on a plane. Good point. You're sending them here all the way to my house, now in a box that I have to yeah. recycle, all to get the bags to go out and use. So, but I mix because I get the whole plastic bag ban, but yeah. in a situation like that, they're very useful. So th what they're pushing, one of the options they're pushing instead is paper bags, right? And I got to tell okay. you, paper bags don't make a whole lot of sense in Manhattan for a couple of reasons. And just think about the use case. Um, if you're in the burbs, the bag is to get from checkout to the cart and from the cart into your car. Is that about right? Correct. Yes. Right. And then from your car to your kitchen counter, once you're in, from your, yes. dri your driveway, right? That's not how it works here. Here, you're carrying it either several blocks home or down subway steps or, or onto the bus, right? <laughs> no, no direct path is what I'm hearing. Right. And a lot of different steps. The, you need durable uh, transportation baggage here. Absolutely. And, yeah. And you think about parenting, it's one of our parenting uh, feats that we can handle carrying 15 bags. I mean, I've been known yeah. to carry my fair share of bags in the house. You know, one trip's better than 15. Yeah. And you personally can't do that with a 
paper bag. And I now, don't know about t- you, but I can't reuse a paper bag. Well, just take this one other uh, element into consideration. What if it's raining? Which holds up better in soaking oh, rain, paper or plastic? <laughs> I just would, not that it would be funny, but maybe a little bit to see someone carrying like six plastic bags in the rain on the subway going down. That might be a a really rough day. Well, with a paper bag, if a paper bag gets soaked, it's basically tissue paper at that point. I mean, just to make clear, I mean, that thing's not going to hold anything. Nothing. So, yeah. So another, another, uh, so this is, you know, those are two reasons why this is not so great for city dwellers. Again, just um, pet, uh, cleanup <laughs> and paper bags aren't so as durable as plastic. So the third use case that they're kind of pushing is reusable bags. Yeah. Yes. So the reason that doesn't really quite work for Manhattanites or New York city dwellers is because the way we go to the supermarket feels a little different than it might be for other folks. So in, in Manhattan, you don't go every Saturday at a set times per se, but rather you pop into the supermarket when you happen to be walking by or when it happens to, you know, you happen to have a a spare, you know, some spare time. But because this is sort of a a mobile type situation, that means if you're going to rely on reusable bags, you kind of have to have it with you at all times in case you go to the supermarket that day. It's it's (laughs) not like uh, you just leave it in your car and then it's always there. We we don't drive cars, you know? (laughs) Right. That's, that's an interesting point. And even us that do drive cars, Mm -hmm. I barely remember to bring them. Even though I, because I, I, you get finished and you think, I got to go put these in the car. And inevitably, you don't remember. Yeah. And um, this is uh, the last reason that sort of neutral city or suburbs is um, apparently reusable bags are extremely um, unsanitary. <laughs> they are. Um, I will agree with you. I always, I don't put my meat in them mm-hmm. um, because you can't like wash them or anything. I don't know. It's just... You know, I love the idea. I mean, and you can really hold a lot of stuff in them. They have a, mm-hmm. a good purpose, but yeah, they do get kind of dirty. And the, just the fact of the matter is people don't wash them. I mean, I guess we all know we should, but we just don't. So you have traces of raw meat. You have traces of whatever from your produce. Yeah. And it's just like a breeding ground for bacteria. So Absolutely. there's that. <laughs> yeah, that sounds really lovely. All right, cool. Let's get, let's move on to congestion pricing. Do you know much about this, Janice? That, I know nothing about that. All right. So this is definitely a city thing. Um, yes. Basically, it's a, it's a way for cities to legislate, uh, create rules to reduce traffic, right? Uh, what it's, it's done a lot of different ways in Singapore and London, but the example that they're proposing in New York is to create um, anything below Central Park during, I think, you know, business hours, you have to pay an extra couple of bucks to be in that area. Really? Right? Is that driving and parking or just? I believe it's just there, driving. I think okay. it's just dri- any any vehicular activity below Central Park. And I think it's just during business hours, right? I guess that would be week, weekdays, nine to nine to five or eight to six, whatever. Okay. So that's, that's the, that's the premise. That's the proposal that we're, we're considering here. Uh, so just in general, if you want to look at prior examples, Singapore had uh, has has um, has instituted congestion pricing, and they saw a commiserate nineteen percent drop in their retail real estate prices. Uh-huh. I mean, if you don't have the foot traffic, if you don't have people driving in, you don't have shoppers, right? So th- there Correct. is a there's an impact. Yeah. Interesting. So I know you. But this might be a little harder for you to imagine. So I'll, I'll just jump into the Manhattan way of thinking about it. The Potential unintended consequence. Here's one, of the, here's one of the potential unintended consequences. If you're drawing this line at Central Park and everything below there is, um, is congestion priced or is subject to congestion pricing. I mean, I think it's easy to imagine this whole, I don't know what to call it, border community. <laughs> <laughs> like where, the edge, the other yeah, the, side. <laughs> exactly. Where everyone drives right up to that line parks their cars and then walks in or switches to public transportation. And you're creating these, you're just moving the congestion. Right? <laughs> That's very true because why would you pull in? You just pull over, find the closest spot and walk the right. rest of the way. Right. So that my, actually my office is right, right, right around the uh, central park South. So that could make our area a lot less pleasant, right? If you have all these dudes ah. just sort of parking to swap out, to walk into their office. Right. But we'll see. Right. Who knows? Uh, so this is also not really going to affect people who live in Manhattan or the residential real estate prices, I don't believe, because 
people who live in Manhattan don't have cars. <laughs> this, is, this really affects commuters. Right. Interesting. <laughs> uh, if anything, it might make everyone's midtown uh, experience a little more pleasant. But again, there, there could be the cost at the edges, as we talked about. And lastly, this could definitely impact real estate prices for commuter neighborhoods that don't have great public transportation. So, for example, uh -huh. you have a house in Bayside right by the Long Island Railroad, as an example, as example A, versus <laughs> yeah. a house in, let's say, what's... I can't even think I'm not that good with just let's say another Queens slash Long Island community. That's not so close to the, to the public transportation that th that neighborhood would be a little bit more reliant on your car to get to work or other situations. And if you have this sort of congestion price and that makes that more expensive, I can see the prices of those areas dipping a little bit and maybe the prices, the home values uh, of the more um, commutable neighborhoods going up a little bit. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Because you would want to live closer to where you could jump on mass transit right. and not have to worry about taking your car halfway to that borderline, as you call yeah. it. Yeah, that makes total sense. Yeah. So that's congestion pricing. And lastly, let's talk about smoking bans. Do you have a... You have uh, any strong feelings on this? Does this affect? Are there any smoking so, bans in place where you're at? It, it does. They, they've enacted a lot of the smoking where you cannot smoke in restaurants and such. Now, I am not a smoker. I have never been cool. particularly despise the smell, um, <laughs> but I understand that people do it, and you know, I can see both sides as I can yeah. with all these other things. Um, but we definitely have thing, uh, a lot of rules here. Uh, a lot of the restaurants have done away with it. Cool. So I think New York was one of the first places to ban smoking in public places, I think in 2002. And then next after that was restaurants. And, um, and generally now there are a lot of apartments, condos, and just buildings in general that have adopted a smoke free policy. Right. Um, so oh, the reason I, we, the reason we're talking about this is because one of the new proposed laws is to increase the New York City smoking age from 18 to 21. What's the smoking age where you are, where you are Janice? Do you oh, know? It's 18. Right. 18. Okay. I'm not really sure what the difference is between 18 and 21 because it feels like kids will find a way to get their cigarettes, but whatever. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> especially, especially now with all those like e-cigarettes and it smells like yeah, fruit juice yeah. and you can't even tell. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, you know, maybe they're just trying to yeah. keep people from getting into it in the first place. I'm not sure, but. Yeah. It doesn't seem like there's a cost to the taxpayers to change the, the age. So whatever, why not? Yeah. Um, so yeah, anecdotally, uh, brokers do seem to believe that, uh, smoke-free apartments will sell faster and more easily than I guess buildings or apartments without any such rules. Would you say the same, the same holds true for houses in the burbs? Absolutely. Without a question. Um, I can tell you personally, the mm -hmm. first house that I ever purchased yep. was a home that someone had smoked in. So we oh, knew boy. that when we moved in, we could smell it a little bit, just a little, uh, mm -hmm. um, you know, we did all the shampooing of the carpets and we did the thorough cleaning fast forward to when we moved out, maybe seven, six years later, seven years later, when we moved our stuff into our new home, which, which was non-smoking hundred mm -hmm. percent, I could smell the cigarette smoke on like some of our furniture oh, boy. that, and we never smoked ever. So you could actually smell it on our things when we moved to the new house seven years later. So it does stick. Mm. Yeah. All right. Well, so you know, it is the same here when you smell that people are really thinking about that now. You know, in a, in a really uh, unrelated way, I ordered, a, I think it was a Wi-Fi router from, from eBay just to save a couple of bucks I was buying it used. And I didn't specify, I didn't think to specify, but the seller was, I guess, a super heavy smoker. So the router reeked of nicotine right. and cigarettes. I was like, wow, how can an appliance a, smell? <laughs> a, a plastic appliance. Yeah. I mean, yeah. so once the smoke, if, if, the, if it is an inside smoker, mm -hmm. it just penetrates whatever. I mean, it doesn't matter. Like, is it a router? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so let's get into some stats. Uh, we looked it up. It looks like 60% of folks prefer to live in a place that prohibits smoking, like just straight up bans it. That's interesting. And 50% of renters say they'd be willing to pay more to live in a smoke-free building. So there's actually a premium for this health issue, I, let's call it, health and quality of life. Yeah? Yes. Yep. Uh, and there was a 19, or excuse me, a 2016 court case here in New York where uh, the, the New York courts ruled that when smoke seeped from one co-op unit into another, the, the victim unit owner, the one who was not a non-smoker and was being affected by the, you know, the neighboring smoker, 
won his, won her court case and was held that she didn't have to pay her maintenance for six years because it was wow. basically um, the co-op didn't do a good enough job of protecting her from her neighbor smoke. So it basically made her apartment uninhabitable. And that's uh, that actually is summed up to about one hundred twenty thousand dollars. Wow. <laughs> wow. Now, are there some places that um, in, in the city, you know, I'm going to these co-ops that that mm -hmm. prohibit smoking and some that are just whatever you feel since it's your apartment? It's your unit. Yeah. OK. I, yeah, that's pretty much how it goes. Well, co-ops are, are um, like dictatorships. The Whatever the board decides is what okay. the rules are for the building. Condos are a little bit more like you own your little plot of land. It just happens to be stacked in a building, right? Got it. Uh, and there's common areas, kind of like a homeowner's association. Co-ops are different. Co-ops are you have joined our dictatorship. <laughs> you submit to us. <laughs> you will do uh, as I say. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. But yeah, so co-ops co can t tend to be more authoritarian in their rules enforcement. Uh, condos have to be a little bit more um, cognizant of what sort of public policy is, what social norms are. And it sounds like from the stats we're talking about that the social norms are trending towards just non-smoking in general. Absolutely. And, and like you had said, it, people would pay a little bit more to be in a non-smoking. Yeah. I personally um, believe that I would if you told me it was a $100 difference, of course, making that up, yep. to be in a smoke-free building, yep. I would definitely, definitely consider it if not do it. Yeah. So we, uh, one of our prior apartments, we had a smoking neighbor, which way was it? Which direct? I don't remember which direction it was up, down, side, or left or right, but it can definitely go through walls in Manhattan. So yeah, you want to be in a smoke-free building. Yeah. Cool. So yeah, that's it. That's, those are the three big upcoming um, proposed l legal changes that could have an impact on, uh, on your New York home buying experience. Uh, check out the book uh, on Amazon, how to buy your perfect first home. And otherwise, Janice, are we good to go? Absolutely. We'll talk again soon. Cool. Take care. Bye now.